Thanks for tuning in to Office Hours. I'm Ashley Yeager, science writer in Duke's Office of News and Communications. And joining us today is biologist Sanka Johnson, who studies deep sea creatures like giant squid and bottom-dwelling crabs that can see ultraviolet light. Thanks for joining us, Sanka. Oh, thanks. Let's talk first about your work on deep, deep sea camouflage. You've discovered that some squid and octopi species can change their colors. Why would they need that type of camouflage? Okay, so there are a bunch of different ways to do camouflage in the ocean. Um, one of the ways that they use a lot that we don't see much on land is transparency, where basically the light goes completely through you and you're invisible like the invisible man. Um, this works really well except when you get deep because once you get deep, there's really no more light anywhere except for bioluminescence. And the bioluminescence down there comes in different forms, but one of the forms are basically flashlights mounted uh, basically on the cheekbones of lots of different kinds of fish. And so they're traveling around with these flashlights. And if you've ever walked around with a flashlight at night, you know that if you aim it at a sheet of glass or anything else, it reflects light back and you can see it. And so being transparent at depth whenever somebody's shining a flashlight at you doesn't work. And so what these animals will do is they'll switch over to being opaque and they'll color themselves in a color that just doesn't reflect the color of the flashlights. And in these cases, the flashlights are almost always blue. And so they'll make themselves either black or they'll make themselves red because red doesn't reflect any light. And they'll do it back and forth very, very quickly. So if you just put them in dim light, they'll be nice and clear. You shine a flashlight on them, they turn red, and then they'll go back and they'll do this like, you know, in a tenth of a second or, or less or so. You mentioned bioluminescence. Can, mm -hmm. you, can you explain what that, what that is just a little yeah, bit? Yeah, so bioluminescence are basically animals making light. On land, we think of it as a pretty rare phenomenon. You know, we think, you know, fireflies have it, maybe a couple mushrooms and glow, glow worms, things of that sort. But underwater, probably about 90% of the animals make light, especially out in the open ocean and especially at depth. Mm -hmm. And they use it for a lot of different things. Some animals just use bioluminescence to blind everything around them. So, you know, they put out a blast of light and all these poor animals are nice and dark adapted. It's like a flash bulb going off and they're blinded and then, you know, a little animal can run away. Um, other animals, like I mentioned, use them as flashlights. They basically you know, go around looking for stuff. Um, some actually use them for communication, for courtship, things of that sort. And some even use bioluminescence to hide out okay. there. And so you mentioned having flashlights. I think we actually have some video of these squid and octopi um, mm -hmm. responding to some light that you mm -hmm. guys had sh uh, shown on them. Maybe we can pull that up and mm -hmm. you can kind of talk us through what's going on mm -hmm. um, when... Sure when the squid respond to the light. Oh, I think it's over here. Oh, okay. All right, so what you're looking at here, it's a um, octopus, a transparent octopus, um, lives about oh, like a thousand, two thousand feet under the ocean. And normally it's very clear and it, it can make itself opaque because it has all these little sort of circles on it called chromatophores. Um, actually, now we're going to switch over to a squid. And what they can do is when you shine light on them, these little chromatophores, these little circles of color, they'll expand really quickly. Um, I'm not sure if we have enough resolution to really pick it out, but basically every time you shine a light on these things, they will expand and make the animal opaque, usually sort of like a reddish brownish color. Wow. And they'll go back and forth between the two. So they're sort of paying attention to the light field around them and then choosing what's the best camouflage tactic for that. Okay. And so this is happening in the, in the deep ocean and so they're using this when other animals are shining their lights on them. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and this work is funded in part, it's a seven and a half million dollar grant, right? Mm -hmm. From um, the Office of Naval, Naval Research. Yeah. Why would the Navy and other agencies like DARPA be interested in deep sea camouflage? Well, they're actually, they're funny about this. So, I mean, you could naturally think that camouflage would make sense for the Navy, especially underwater camouflage. Um, but they, as they put it, they say, stay in your academic lane. Um, mm -hmm. They're mostly interested in us just focusing on basic research. If they eventually find an application for it, then they will go ahead and do so. But they actually tell us to not even speculate on what they might oh. particularly use it for. Um, okay. I suppose they worry that if we accidentally stumbled on something they were doing that was classified, then it would be a problem. I don't know. But they treat it really as basic research. And there are a number of these different divisions. There's one in the Air Force. There's one in the Army. There's one in the Navy. 
And within them, they operate not so differently from NSF in that you get money to work on a basic science research problem. Okay. And we talked a little bit about uh, animals giving off their own light. Can you talk about some of the animals that you've studied that do this? Um, well, they pretty much all do. Um, it's just figuring out why they do what they do. One of the neater ones we found, um, there's an octopus, a deep sea octopus. And so most octopus, you know, live on the ground, sort of crawl around. But there are few that live out in the water column, column and swim. And there's one of these, it was called Starotuthis. And what it had done is it had converted all of its suckers into light organs. And so the suckers no longer sucked. You know, normally they can kind of grab on, pull things, manipulate prey and so on. Mm -hmm. But these, all the muscle tissue and everything else had converted over into organs that produce light with little back reflectors and everything else. And they could create this um, sort of twinkling display that like sort of like runway lights that would go down towards their mouth. And so it's kind of like a lure as far as we could tell. You know, animals would come in, so they'd see all these little twinkling lights come in, and they wouldn't see, you know, of course, the big dark mouth in the middle. They will you know, chomp on them. But we really liked it because it was a neat example of sort of evolution, sort of caught mid-step or so. Because, you know, you're taking a structure that was used for something very different, you know, originally a muscular tissue used for, you know, sucking, attaching onto prey and converting it over into these light organs. And we sort of caught it in the middle of these two things, sort of showing how evolution, you know, might work. Wow. Okay. So that was, you know, one of, one of my favorites. Of yeah. That. Are there any others that kind of struck you as odd that they would give off their own light? Well, a lot of it's, so we have a real problem in the ocean that we can't study the animals undisturbed. Mm. So, you know, if you're on land, you know, you can sort of hide in the woods and watch a beaver lodge and learn everything you ever wanted to know about beavers. You can put a little camera in there or whatever and learn all about their family life, and they're relatively undisturbed. Underwater, it's almost impossible for us to do this, so we're always kind of guessing as to what they're actually using things for. So a lot of the bioluminescence, we have ideas for, but we really don't know why. And so puzzling things are a lot of bioluminescent animals are blind. So, you know, they put out all this light, um, but they can't see it. And so apparently they're only putting it out for other animals, but sometimes we don't really know why they're doing that. And some of the patterns they put out are really impressive. They're not just sort of turning on and glowing, but they create pinwheel display displays that look sort of like fireworks and sparklers and all these different things that are just amazingly conspicuous, and we don't really know why. And in many cases, they can't actually see it themselves. Oh, wow. um, so it's a... It's deep sea biology has a lot of questions and a lot of neat things with very few answers mm -hmm. um, because it's so difficult to figure out anything at all. And as soon as you go down there with, let's say, a submersible, or whatever else, you've disturbed the environment so badly that you can't really figure out what's naturally going on there. Right. And you did some work on, I guess, crabs, right, that can see ultraviolet light and, and blue light. Why yeah. would they need that ability? Yeah, so this was a really weird thing that's been known for a while, and this was done with a colleague of mine, Tammy Frank, um, that there are deep sea animals, particularly shrimp and crabs, things of that sort, that can see ultraviolet light. Um, but there's no ultraviolet light down there. Um, you know, by, the, by that depth, it's long gone. So it makes no sense at all. Um, and they tend to have two sort of color channels, or you know, you can think of like cones, like we have cones in our eyes. One is usually seeing blue light, and the other one's seeing this sort of violet, ultraviolet light. And as near as we can tell, they're doing it so that they can have really good color vision in this range between the blue and the violet. And this is where a lot of bioluminescence occurs. And so for us, when we look at bioluminescence, a lot of it looks to be about the same color. It just looks like lighter blue, darker blue, and so on. But for animals like this that have a particular color vision system set up, they're pretty good at being able to sort out, at least theoretically, what all the different colors are. And so they can use it to determine, you know, what animal is waking, you know, what particular light, you know, choosing particular prey items, um, separating out something that might be toxic from something that's, you know, actually good to eat. And this was all part of a project where we were interested in the bioluminescence of the deep sea floor. And what we found is that there are are animals that are actually on the deep sea floor, big, stable animals like corals and things of that sort that hang up in the water column. And they are relatively toxic um, and glow fairly green. 
Um, and then at the same time, there's all this plankton that move through the water that are good to eat, and they all glow fairly blue. And the interesting thing is the animals that can see ultraviolet light and have this really good ability to discriminate different blues and blue-greens sit up on these corals, and they wait for the food to come by in the water. Um, but they're doing all this in the dark, so they can't actually see the coral. They can't actually see the plankton. All they can see are the glows. And so they're sort of, in a way, grabbing blindly. And what we think, but we're not sure, is that, you know, if they grab the coral by mistake and it glows green, then they know this is bad, this is poison, don't eat it. If it glows blue, then they know, oh, this is food, this is plankton coming by, eat it. And so they're basically using this UV vision combined with their blue vision to give them the color vision they need to basically sort out food by color, kind of like a color-coded food idea. You know, <laughs> blue food good, green food bad kind of a thing. Oh, wow. So that's sort of the idea, but again... It's all so deep and so difficult to get to and to watch that it may be a long time before we can directly prove that they're doing this. And so we do sort of what we call forensic biology. You know, we always work from, you know, the scene of the crime in a way. You know, we know that, you know, these animals glow like this, this animal can see this and that. We put it all together, you know, basically from the ship and then try to recreate what we think most likely happened at depth because we can't actually observe it directly because any of our observing tricks disturb the environment right. just so dramatically. In many cases, we end up blinding the animals, and then you're not seeing anything good at all. And you're talking about at depth. How, how deep are we talking? Um, we go down to about 3,000 feet. Okay. And, you know, personally, if we go down in a submersible, and this particular project went down to, yeah, two to 3,000 feet, depending on which site. Um, when we do, when we trawl for animals, we can collect them down to about 10,000 feet. Oh, wow. Okay. So pretty deep. Yeah. And you mentioned a submersible. So do you do both scuba diving and go down in subs? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This, when we do scuba diving, we generally don't go deeper than about 100 feet. Mm -hmm. And this, the submarine goes down to about 3,000 feet. Okay. Okay. And, and that submarine, uh, how big is it? What's it like? Uh, it looks like sort of a cross between a small school bus and a helicopter. Um, so it's about the size of one of those short buses. Um, and then the front half looks very much like the bubble on a helicopter. And there are two people that sit in there, one of which is the pilot that actually knows what they're doing. And then the person next to them is the scientist. And you're squished in very, very tight. You know, the whole sphere is smaller in diameter than this table. Oh, wow. um, and then in the back, there's another chamber with a backup pilot who's there to save everybody if the front pilot dies. Um, and another scientist. And they're in basically a steel container with little portals mm -hmm. and a hatch that you can open in the bottom. And what they used to do is they would actually pressurize the back cabin and to the same pressure as what was outside. Then you could open up the hatch, the water wouldn't come in, and then you, they could go scuba diving at like a thousand feet underwater. Oh, wow. um, they don't do it anymore because it turned out to be not very good for your health. Um, but it was pretty cool. Yeah. So yeah, the whole thing, yeah, small school busy kind of side. Okay. Okay. And how many times have you gone down in it? I don't know, dozens or so. Wow. I'm, I'm not really sure. I've never <laughs> actually counted, but a, right. a good amount of times. Right. It's a lot of fun. You always yeah. see something new. Oh man, that must be incredible. Um, was this something that you had always planned on doing, kind of this deep sea biology? You mean in my life? Yeah. No. <laughs> no, 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 no. No, I... I actually entered biology grad school with only one course in biology, which was in ninth grade, mm -hmm. um, where I actually didn't learn any biology. Um, no, I originally, I think I originally thought I was going to be a physicist. Mm -hmm. uh, my dad was a physicist, and I sort of always thought I'd head that direction. And got to college and didn't like my physics courses that much. Um, and I liked my math courses, mostly because the math professors were kind of funny where I was. And so I took that. Um, and then really wasn't sure afterwards. I did a lot of sort of random things. I worked as a kindergarten teacher. I actually worked running a daycare center. Um, I was a freelance carpenter for quite a number of years. I was sort of a mathematician for hire. Believe it or not, there are such things. Uh, I was a computer programmer for a while. Um, and really went to biology grad school on a whim. Mm -hmm. um, sort of just to see what it was like. And it was only after a year of being in it that I decided this was you know, really a great thing to do. Um, and at that time, I wasn't interested in deep sea biology at all. I was working more on coastal animals, okay. uh, much shallower ones. And it wasn't until I did a postdoc after grad school that I learned about the deep ocean and all that. Mm -hmm. And then in terms of how, uh, uh, I guess, getting into animals that give off their own light mm -hmm. and, um, 
and squid and octopi. Mm -hmm. Was there something about them that drew you to them? Um, well, yes. Yeah. So a thing that always appealed to me my whole life was art. Um, and actually, probably I took more art and dance classes in college than anything else um, by quite a bit. I mean, by the time I left college, I think I was doing dance stuff about 20 hours a week and art stuff about 20 hours a week. And then math was sort of off in the corner. Um, so and I've done photography since I was pretty young and a lot of different painting and sculpting, building furniture. And I, I sort of came out of a family where you built, you know, sort of everything you had. And so I always enjoyed all those kind of things. And so when I went into biology, sort of the artistic aspect of it really appealed to me. So I was very interested in vision and light and color, and things of that sort. And so those fields just kind of drew me in. Yeah. And one of the biggest things, I guess, or kind of one of the most exciting things you study are, are giant squid. Mm -hmm. um, maybe you can tell us a little bit about those really big guys and, and how you got interested in studying them. Yeah. Well, so, you know, as everybody knows, they're really big. Um, <laughs> they're the biggest invertebrates, and there's sort of two main sort of genuses of them. You know, one are, you know, what they call Archituthis, which are very long and thin, get to be about 80 feet long or so. And there's another one called the Colossal Squid that isn't quite as long, but is a lot sort of chubbier, I guess you could put it, and, you know, ultimately weighs more. And they both have just ginormous eyes. Um, and, of course, you know, they're large. Um, but most other large things, the size of their eye doesn't go up nearly as fast as the size of their body. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it's like a blue whale, its eye is a few inches across. And, you know, blue whale is enormous. Um, swordfish actually have really, really pretty big eyes for their size, but still it maxes out at a few inches across. And these get out basically around basketball size. So if you look at, you know, the eyes of colossal squid, giant squid, you know, you're basically looking at a basketball, sort of between soccer ball, basketball size. Um, so very, very large for an animal that isn't, you know, as big as a blue whale. I mean, you know, it's not as long and it's certainly not even close to as massive. I mean, a blue whale outweighs a giant squid by an incredible amount. Um, so the question always was, you know, why do you need such a big eye? And, you know, one thing we thought, well, you know, squid in general have fairly big eyes. Maybe they just sort of scale up. But one, doing that sort of experiment is very difficult because you have a lot of pretty small squid and all of a sudden giant squid off in the corner. And so you can't do a normal scaling relationship very well. And even if you do, they still end up being pretty large for what you predict for that size. I mean, having about, I think we calculated about 200 times the volume they should have for that size. So still quite a bit bigger than you'd expect. So we we're really intrigued, you know, what are they using them for? I mean, what do you need a really, really big eye? Yeah. Um, yeah. And you said these, these squid have eyes as big as basketballs. I mean, mm -hmm. that's just, that, that's really, really big. Um, I think we might have an image of one that mm -hmm. maybe we can show just so people get a sense mm -hmm. of what these, these creatures look like. And so when you were working on trying to understand their eyes, you came up with this idea that they are trying to spot their main predator, the sperm whale. Uh, yeah, so if, that, yeah. Yeah, that was sort of what we ended up coming. So we put together and it was, it was actually kind of funny because when the paper came out, you know, it came out in a journal that a lot of people read and so we got a lot of press and everybody wanted us to basically describe how we swam down with the giant squid and saw them actually like, you know, chasing sperm whales and all. And you can't do that. Um, you know, there is now footage of live giant squid um, which, you know, just came out on National Geographic recently, but it doesn't show the giant squid actually doing anything. I mean, it's not like showing a battle between it and a sperm whale and all that. <laughs> um, that's just not what we can do yet. Um, and so we attacked it pretty mathematically. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, we knew a lot about the eye from eyes that have been collected and eyes that we collected. And we know a lot about how vision works and how vision and water works and so on. And so together we, along with Eric Warren and Don Eric Nilsson over in Sweden, put together a nice model of what's going on and then looked at what gets better as an eye gets bigger mm -hmm. and a lot of things get better until you get about to the eye of like a swordfish um, and then most things level out and as you might guess having a really big eye well one you need a really big head you need a lot of energy it takes a lot of work to have a really big eye i mean you know these eyes are bigger than our heads i mean it's a big eye um so we had to think about you know what is still getting better that would you know drive natural selection to keep making this eye bigger and the one thing that you can do with a really, really big eye is see things that are really far away in murky water. Um, that's the one thing you can do. 
Now, most things that are really, really far away, and we're talking 100 meters away, um, are already too small to see. I mean, even, you know, your average, you know, like, what do you mean, like a mackerel or whatever, 100 meters away, you know, it's like a little dot, so you can't see it anyway. So anything you're going to see that far away already has to be really huge to begin with. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of those things that are really huge are also moving through the water and stirring up lots of bioluminescence as they move. Um, basically, many animals will bioluminesce when you run into them. And so big animals at depth, things like sperm whales and all those sort of things, they actually have a, a cloud of light around them as they move and a cloud of light behind them in this wake. So there's, they basically look like an enormous blob of dim light. And the one thing that a really, really big eye will let you do is see that enormous blob from very far away, um, way farther than you could you know, with like a swordfish size, size eye. And so the idea, and again, you know, we're left with a sort of forensic biology where we're probably not going to see a sperm whale and a giant squid have it out there. That would be really cool. Um, <laughs> is that, yeah, this is why they have such an enormous eye. Okay. And there is some contention with mm -hmm. that idea. Some people or some other scientists are arguing that these giant colossal mm -hmm. squid simply have an eye as big, mm -hmm. as big as it should be for such a, a big creature. What do, you, what do you think about that argument? Yeah, so, well, one, first of all, one great thing about science is we get to argue about these things. And, you know, I know all the people who wrote that particular paper and we're writing a rebuttal. And so we argue about it. And that's a great thing about science is we get to argue about these things. Um, so personally, we don't really believe it for some of the reasons I already mentioned. One, you know, their argument depends very much on extrapolating from the sizes of eyes of pretty small squid, squid that are like this or so, up to giant squid size. Um, they have a few that are kind of in an intermediate range, but you're still jumping by about a factor of 100 or so in length before you get out to what you're going to predict. Um, and whenever you try to predict something that far from what you already know, you know, it's very difficult to do well. And the other thing is even based on their particular curve, um, the animal, giant squid eyes end up being big for what that prediction is. They end up, like I said, having a volume of about 200 times um, what you'd see. And so we're, you know, as I said, we're writing a rebuttal to this, but it'll probably continue on, you know, we'll argue back and forth. And as I said, we don't actually get to see it happen. And so, you know, we're going to have to argue it out because we're just not going to get the sort of evidence we'd really like to settle it. Right, right. And when you said that you're writing a rebuttal, are you doing uh, other uh, theoretical work, other tests to try to come up with more evidence for your Theory, um, yeah, it's some of that, and it's some of responding so, to mm -hmm. some of the comments they make. It'll be some analysis of their scaling relationships and so on. Um, so there'll be some new things, but mostly um, addressing the particular things they said. Okay. Um, a nice thing about the whole project is we, you know, we really like giant squid and all that, but we chose them as a case study to develop a model of how vision works underwater, mm -hmm. which is what we really wanted to do. Mm -hmm. We wanted to figure out, you know, how does vision work? You know, why do you need a big eye? Why do you need a small eye? Why do you need to be able to see certain colors versus others? And how does bioluminescence play into this? How does depth play into it? How does fluorescence and a lot of other things? And so we're writing a separate paper that is sort of is the big general case of sort of how vision works in the deep sea. Okay. And so all this mm -hmm. idea of vision and light in mm -hmm. the deep sea, it's something that all of your work focuses on. You have a new book out called The Optics of Life, A Biologist's Guide to Light in Nature. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if maybe you could tell us a little bit about why you wrote this book and what you hope people will get from reading oh. it. Yeah, I wrote it because I was spending a lot of time on the phone, actually. Um, because the, the main problem with people who work in biological optics, things of this sort, is there are no books. Um, in fact, there's no way to learn it at all except from somebody who already knows it. Um, and most of the people who know the optics are physicists, and the physicists don't communicate too well with the biologists and vice versa. And so there are very few people out there that can sort of successfully talk to both worlds. And so you're kind of winging it. I was pretty lucky. I had a postdoc advisor, Edie Witter, who was really good at both biology and optics, who could start training me on how to do it. And I sort of found other people along the way. But I was spending a lot of time on the phone because people would call me and they'd say, you know, I did this set of experiments. It took half a year to do. I did a thousand scuba dives, this and that. I submitted the paper and the reviewer says it's all worthless because I didn't put, you know, a 20 cent piece of cardboard around my measuring tube, which, you know, would have done this. How can I fix this? Mm -hmm. And I usually answer is, you can't. You're 
it's a really a shame. You know, you worked really hard and it's a waste. Um, other times you'd say, well, you can do this. Um, but I was just spending a lot of time on the phone trying to advise people. Um, and I was thinking, wow, you know, if I wrote a book, then, you know, I could say, you know, read chapter four or read chapter three. Um, turns out that turned out to probably be more work than actually talking on the phone was. But I did enjoy it. Um, and it was really tricky because you're trying to translate physics for biological minds. Um, you know, biologists and physicists are equally smart, but they think about things very, very differently. You know, biologists are very comfortable with a lot of ambiguity, a huge amount of diversity, a huge amount of complexity, generally aren't as comfortable with equations and math. The physicists are very good at the math and the equations, but are not as comfortable with all the sort of messy, wishy-washiness, diversity and complexity of biology. And so you need a way of sort of bridging that gap. Um, and that was sort of the challenge of the book, but it was also very fun. I mean, you know, I got to sort of put in all my particular pet peeves, all of my advice, things I wanted to say and do and what people should do and actually have sort of fun doing it. Um, and we actually just finished a second book this week. Hmm. Um, it just went to the um, publisher to start the production process. And it's all about, it's called visual ecology, basically how vision works in the environment. You know, why does a bee see one way and a human sees another way, a monkey sees another way, and a giant squid sees another way? Mm -hmm. How does environment influence it? How does evolution influence it? Um, and all those different things together. So that'll be coming out actually, I guess, in about a year. Oh, great. And you have had a kind of a winding path into science and, and mm -hmm. kind of gone a bunch of different routes. What advice do you have for young ex aspiring scientists as they think about launching their careers? Probably the same advice I give anybody, um, <laughs> do what you like. Um, I mean, my path really was very winding. Um, it went all over the map and there were parts of it where I was very poor and other parts of it where I wasn't. And none of it makes any sense. But at the time, at any given time, I was really happy doing what I was doing. When I was teaching dance to three-year-olds and teaching them all how to be a flower and all that kind of stuff, it was really fun. <laughs> um, and then when I was doing, you know, the carpentry work, it's what I really loved to do at the time. Um, and kindergarten teaching and the you know, same for all of it, for the programming, the math part, and eventually, you know, being in biology and the different projects that it is. I always chose what I thought was going to be the most fun. Because um, my feeling was, you know, you don't really know how your life's going to turn out. You don't know what kind of job you're going to get. And all these weird things will fall in your path that you don't know. You know, you'll meet somebody that only wants to live in Alaska. And, you know, that's going to change <laughs> your whole life. Um, you'll get that really lucky job you thought you'd never get. Or you won't for some really weird reason, like you had a flu the day you interviewed. And so, you know, your life isn't really up to you in that way. You can't plan 10 years in the future. Um, but what you can do is do what you like in the moment. And then, you know, looking back on it, you'll always have been doing things you like. Um, so, I mean, that's usually my main advice is, you know, choose really fun things to do that really, you know, intrigue you at the moment and keep your eyes open for the next thing. And things have a habit of working their way out. They just won't follow the path you might have originally planned. I mean, I talk to this a lot. I mean, I advise undergrads and a lot of them have known they were going to go to med school since they were maybe 10 years old. Um, and then many will then go to med school and discover within six months, this isn't really what they wanted. Um, and then they're, you know, getting out of it and so on. And so I do try to at least put a little bug in their ear to, you know, think, think about all of it. You know, think about what you'd really like to do. Because, um, you know, you only get one life. You might as well have a good time with it. Yeah, that's great advice. Thank you so much for spending time with us, Sanka. Mm -hmm. Sanka Johnson is a professor of biology at Duke. He'll be heading out to do some more research on deep sea animals pretty soon. And we wish you the best of luck. Oh, thanks. Next up on Office Hours is William Wright Swaddell, Director of the Career Services at Duke. And he'll be talking about job hunting. We hope you join us. <laughs>